Uh, first of all, thank you so much, Natalie, and the rest of the organizers for this invitation. It is really a pleasure to be part of a conference with all these great talks. Uh, my talk, I think, ties especially well into what George said earlier. Uh, it is also a talk about this um, field in between education and game development and the tension in there. And I share many of the experiences that, that George talked about earlier of being in these kinds of teams where there is a kind of friction between different goals when you try to produce serious games. What I will be doing is to present a study that is published in uh, the Journal of Simulation and Gaming that I've written together with Björn Sjöblom. But first, who are we? Uh, my name is Jonas Linderoth. I have a background as an art teacher. I am a professor in the field of education and at least for two more months I'm also a professor in, in a field called Media Anesthetics and Storytelling. I will move out of Skövde and lose that title soon, so I will take the opportunity now to be a professor in two subjects here for the last time probably in public. Uh, I publish mainly in the field of game studies uh, and as I said I'm transiting from Skövde back to my old university of Gothenburg. Björn on the other hand, he has a background in cognitive science, he is a senior lecturer in the field of childhood studies, he publishes mainly in game studies as well as communication studies, he is at the, the Department of Child and Youth Studies, Stockholm University, and both of us are also having some little percentage. We are part-time at the Swedish Defense College's game section, where we work with uh, the development and research of uh, games for strategic tactics training for the Swedish military. <clears throat> so the... The article or the, the study that I will be presenting uh, is named Being an Educator and Game Developer, the Role of Pedagogical Content Knowledge in Non-Commercial Serious Games Production. So let's start by unpacking this somewhat long title uh, from the back. <laughs> so what do we mean with non-commercial serious games production? Well, we mean that the phenomena under investigation here is that kind of uh, production of educational games or serious games where a person or an organization are creating games for their own for for one's own teaching needs uh, uh, or an organization you work in products that are somehow never aimed for a commercial market so that's the the phenomena that we're investigating and um, maybe that's something we can discuss but I really believe there is a crucial difference when uh, you create an educational game without the goal of monetizing on it. But that's, that's something we can discuss later. Uh, the other concept that I will need to introduce to you before, before we go further is the concept of pedagogical content knowledge. Pedagogical content knowledge is a term coined by a famous uh, professor in education called Lee Schulman in the 80s, I think it was. 85, 86 something. And Schulman, he said that teachers, first of all, teachers need to have content knowledge. That means that they need to really know their subjects very well. They need to be able to answer complex question and they need to be able to sort of spot mistakes in students thinking and in teaching materials that they see. But I also need to know pedagogy, and that is stuff like theories and principles of learning. They need to have knowledge of different learners, what kind of students they have in front of them and how they learn and their interest. And they need to know principles of, of basic classroom behavior and, and management. However, Schulman said, Pedagogical content knowledge is larger than the sum of the two. That means that you are able to know the specificities of teaching a particular subject for specific types of students. You know, especially if you want, want to teach, for instance, the photosynthesis, if you want to teach, as I do, teach educational game design, <clears throat> you know what good resources are out there. You have... Uh, 
toolbox of different activities that you can use. You know what would be good metaphors for explaining the, the content. Uh, you have good examples that you have developed over the years. And you also know how to, in the best way, sequence the content. You know if a student misses a particular <clears throat> lesson or a particular part, uh, you know what they need to learn in order to pick up the face. So <clears throat> the research question that we pose in this uh, study is basically how do pedagogical content knowledge or the lack of pedagogical content knowledge structure the development of non-commercial serious games? So what does it mean if a person who has pedagogical content knowledge are trained to design a game or actually trained to design a game for their own uh, teaching purposes? Or what does it mean if they lack that knowledge? And we're also interested in what kind, if you have pedagogical content knowledge, how will the development process look and what will sort of, um, what will emerge out of these specific, uh, the specific situation where you have developers that have this kind of knowledge. <clears throat> and we are doing this by comparing two vastly different cases. The first case that we look into in this is a course that is basically called uh, Educational Game Design, a course that I have been ha running for years at the University of Gothenburg. And it is a course uh, where students come. There are three types of students that are attracted by this course. First of all, there are teachers who have been working in, in schools for some time who takes this as their further education. There are teacher students who take this course by the side of their general teacher studies. And there are every year <clears throat> a bunch of gamers or uh, average nerds that are more interested in the game design part than, uh, than they are interested in sort of the educational game and, or the educational part that takes this course. So these three kind of students uh, are in this class. And uh, we do not separate between digital and non-digital games. I would say that most of, the, um, most of the students make board games, and that is because we do not provide training in any, uh, in any uh, game development software. But if they know that when they enter the course, they are free to use that uh, in, in the course. Uh, the focus is more on actually the game mechanics uh, in relation to educational content. So, we think that we can sort of do that without the digitalization of it. Of course, digital games have some uh, specific affordances, but, uh, but that would sort of take way, way longer time if they were to develop uh, competence in a, in a tool first. Now, the other study, that, the other setting that we have been studying is the game section at the National Defense College. Uh, in this section, uh, cadets are trained in tactic trainings by using a two-sided game that the game section have been developing for years themselves. So it's, it's a networked game, as you can see on these images, and the, uh, the students, they sit in different rooms and they have uh, one instructor in each room and then they are simulating different uh, they are simulating different task forces in a, in a conflict and there are at least two very lucky teachers that get to play the opposing side every year uh, who, who really enjoys this and plays the enemy and then they are doing this. They play four times the speed of real time and they play for eight hours, then they take a break and then they come back to the scenario the next day and they do that for two weeks. They play this uh, they play out this conflict uh, and there are many other this is sort of one example of one exercise that they have but the point here is that the game in itself is continuously developed by the national defense defense college so it's not uh, a ready-made product it is constantly developed and it is sort of developed especially for their own training needs so in the study we have uh, quite different informants that has rod different uh, competences. We have employees as the game division who has really high pedagogical content knowledge. They have some gaming experience 
and they're also very good game developers. In the, um, in the class, we have teachers who have high pedagogical content knowledge. They have low, generally low gaming experience and they have almost none uh, game development experience. We have the gamers who have non-pedagogical content knowledge, they have high gaming experience and might have some game development experience out of modding or own self-interest. And we have the teacher students who have some pedagogical content knowledge, often some game experience. These, they are generally younger than the already trained teachers, uh, but they have no game development experience. So. What we have been doing is basically an ethnographic study, observations, interviews, and so on. I will not go into detail of the methods. This is a published paper, and you can, you can look into the nitty bitty gritty details of the actual method in the paper. So I will focus on sort of the result. So one thing that is, that before I go into sort of pedagogical content knowledge, is that one thing that seems really obvious when you study an environment where educational games are made is that educational, the educational part adds complexity to the design process. If we look at Richard Rouse's uh, seminal work on game design, he said that computer game ideas can come from three distinct unrelated areas that are well known to us. You can start in gameplay, you can start in technology, or you can start in story. Basically, according to Richard Rouse, these are the three points of departure where when you sort of make a game. I want to make a game about World War II. I want to make a game for uh, iPads or a board game, or I want to make a game with an interesting auction mechanic. These are sort of the different points of departure you can take. Uh, like that. So gameplay technology and story, a simplistic straightforward uh, formula. However, when you do educational uh, game design, you immediately introduce a fourth dimension and that is of course the, the instructional goals that you have with it. So somewhat boldly I would like to suggest that educational game design uh, is probably, or, or I really think so, is probably more complex than ordinary game design. It has a fourth dimension that makes it, uh, that makes a messy process even messier. So with this in mind, uh, one of the things that we find was that when uh, the developers have, uh, when they have uh, pedagogical content knowledge, they are very keen on starting in the instructional goals. They take sort of the things that, um, that the students are to learn uh, as their point of departure. And that from, from, uh, from an outside point of view, that might seem obvious that maybe if you don't have an experience of these processes, you would think that, okay, isn't that how it always happened? And I can assure you that that isn't always what's happened. And, and I think George's uh, talk earlier illustrated that really well. Uh, it can be quite, quite many times I've been a consultant in projects where uh, educational goals have had to step back in order for the game to have flow, to be fun, and sometimes even to be more uh, commercial, commercially viable. But for instance, here is a quote from uh, the game section where I interviewed their uh, lead one of the lead designers or, and he's also, interestingly enough, he used to work at Games Workshop earlier. Uh, and he says like this, when we design our game platforms, we have tried to focus on the fact that the students are to be exposed to different problems and choice situations. And the game is supposed to create an environment where these problems arise. So the game becomes what it has to become if these problems are to arise. So the point of departure is an extreme sensibility to what, what the students should learn. And this goes so far that uh, in the game section, they have quite a, a vast experience of games. So they do not, if they have an educational problem that they want to approach with a game, they do not predefine whether they even should use a digital game or a board game, a turn-based board game, uh, a 3D game or a 2D game and so on. Uh, and I think that's quite unique 
when have you ever seen a game development project that when the people sit down in the brainstorming room, they don't even know if it's going to be an analog or a digital game. So, so that's, that's a rather interesting case, I think. Uh, I, or I should also say that uh, on the other hand, on the sort of other spectrum of this, uh, we have the, in, in the course, we have the gamer students who aren't really interested in the actual uh, educational goals. Instead, they start in quite different, quite different points. For instance, I had one student who really, he, well, he fell in love in a mechanic from a game called The Mystery of the Abbey. I can't show it to you because my laptop is actually standing on it here. Uh, but uh, he, and he, he had this idea that this mechanic lent itself very well to the idea of Schrödinger's cat. So he had a game mechanic, he had a story. And then he constantly during the course kept asking, so yeah, but I don't really know what you should learn about this. And then in the end, he came up with something extremely vague saying, oh, I made this game when you play it you learn turn taking and that is quite a general thing that i have seen quite many times in these courses that when students uh, are to make an educational game and they start and they don't sort of start in the actual instructional goals they tend to fall into the trap of talking about extremely general non-specific skills so they start to talk about this thing that we call 21st century skill well at least you learn to collaborate at least you learn uh, you learn uh, different forms of, of cognitive training and so on and so so it becomes extremely general really really hard to prove and and uh, uh, to be honest, many teachers find these games rather useless. They aren't really tying into any curriculum anywhere. So, uh, so, th so that, that is sort of these tif different sides of the spectrum. The other thing that you see when the, when the developers has uh, pedagogical content uh, knowledge is that they are very context aware. They are very aware of where their games are to be used. They know the context where the, 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 this tool is to be used and they can foresee problems in, during the design problems. For, so for instance, I had in, in, uh, in one game project, I had these really good, uh, very experienced two math teachers and they had made a car math game uh, where the mechanic was based on a game called Seven Wonders. It's a drafting mechanic and it's very, the, the cards you get in hand are sort of random and the cards you get in hand will then be uh, steering your opportunities to, to gain points during the mathematical exercise that follows in the game. And when we had this um, peer review of this or this comrade review of this, then uh, some gamer students criticized the math teacher's game by saying this has too many random elements. If you are a board gamer, you know that many board gamers despise random elements. They want it to be pure skill based. So it was that kind of critique. And then the teacher said, well, we play tested this with some students. And you know what? We had this girl in class and this, this girl, she's, she's not the best math student at all. Uh, and she played it. And she had the luck of actually getting the best cards. Uh, and that meant that she won that round of the game. And you should see the self-esteem boost it was for her to actually win in a math game. So the math teachers, they knew their learners. They knew a situation where you have students that aren't that good and that they can get a boost. And this means in, in game design terms, they had designed a so-called, you can use randomness as an ego crutch sometimes. Uh, and they had sort of created sort of this in that game. Uh, also, uh, teachers tend to understand that the games they make are only, they, they, sh they will not solve um, every single educational problem they ha you have. They generally design their games for as a sort of part of a larger, longer educational team and design a game that fits in somewhere there as a point of departure that illustrates a specific moment, illustrates something very specific. So, uh, And the final point, and perhaps uh, the most, uh, what I find the most interesting is that when 
designers have pedagogical content knowledge. If you compare their design process to at least sort of some of the common core of game development literature, uh, they break the heuristics, they break the rules of game design, they design against the against the, <laughs> the cookbook of how you should make uh, a game. Here, for instance, it's highlighted by a, one of the developers at the uh, Defense College. He says, if you look at the interface from the gamer's perspective, then I think a bigger deal is that compared to other software, the developer has a natural instinct that usability and UX shall help the user. The user shall get as much help and support as possible. You put as much complexity as possible within the system so that the user is cognitively offloaded and gets an as simple task as possible. And that is put to the test here. And he's talking about the platform that they are doing. Because part of, your, of your, what you want to achieve in the game is a situation that they should be exposed to a certain kind of complexity. So he's talking about how good UX design can ruin educational goals. So here you have uh, one very clear clash between uh, educational game design and what's good for learning purposes and what's good from a UX perspective and maybe a commercially viable game. And there are other, uh, there are other such things for, as I said, creating an intuitive interface, uh, cognitive offloading we want to achieve in, in some, in some uh, software, but here it might be uh, a bad thing. When the students create games, some of them do really good games that aren't fun at all because they want to illustrate, uh, they, they want to put the, uh, their, their students in some form of uh, moral dilemma. So they want to show, they want to train some form of moral values and then the game can be really hard. They, they can bring up really serious questions and it's really hard to talk about them as being fun. I've also seen games, uh, where this idea that the games is a series of meaningful choices is sort of short, short circuited because there are students who want to illustrate how some systems in society uh, doesn't leave a certain group of individuals with their own choice. Uh, they want to sort of um, they want to communicate that to what we call the procedural rhetorics of the game. So then the game actually has no meaningful choices. And that is the point of the actual game. And all of these things are illustrating the fact that uh, when you design an educational game with pedagogical content knowledge in mind, you short circuit quite a lot of ordinary game design values. So four conclusions, uh, and then I'll stop. Uh, pedagogical content knowledge seems to be a competence that is utterly beneficial in the production of serious games. Uh, if I were to sort of go outside of the study and value the games I've seen, I think that some of the most interesting educational games I've ever seen is the one made of teachers. So when you give the teachers game development tools, I think they create really, really interesting stuff that are very useful and they can see educational problems that someone who doesn't work with teaching can't really see. Uh, I would like to claim that educational game design is harder or at least more complex than ordinary game design. Uh, and since that is the case, I think it's important that maybe we should understand educational game design since it breaks from the heuristics of ordinary game design. It should be considered a field in its own right. And I, for one, will uh, run and buy George's book that he presented earlier because, uh, and also I think this seminar really illustrates that really well. I'm very happy to see this, this uh, seminar happening. And I think this is sort of a, a step in the uh, right direction. And finally then, uh, maybe it's easier to teach teachers game design than to have developers learn pedagogical content knowledge. Uh, I think that's, a, it's not a provocative idea. It's more sort of, a, an, I think, an interesting idea. I think that uh, for what I've seen in these large projects where you try to bring in educational experts, where you try to bring in uh, technological competency and game development competency, I think it's always the educational expert who has, uh, who has to stand to the side. Uh, 
who has to sort of be so, so okay you suggest this but now we do like we always do we know games uh, and maybe I would like to see a shift in that power structure that's the main takeaway from my talk so thank you so much for listening and now uh, I'm open for questions <laughs>